Hello and welcome back to my Sandbox CDB series in Kerbal Space Program 1.0.4. The launch for today is the Illinois D shuttle on ETS-7 carrying the Orion Support Arm 1 to Hoffman Station. This arm is meant to help maintenance crews to get around the large Orion 1 space liner once it's docked at the station. It can also be used to disembark passengers via EVA if there's a problem getting them through the rear docking port, a possibility because of unforeseen damage due to the way that the docking port is placed between four rapiers, two turbojets, and two LVN nuclear engines. Everything's a go and we'll pick up the countdown here at T-20, T-15, T-16, T-17, T-18, T-19, T-20, T-21, T-22, T-23, T-24, T-25, and liftoff. We have liftoff of ETS-7 carrying the Orion Support on one to Hoffman Station. A slight imbalance there. Booster is a little bit overpowered, but it looks like Valentina Kerman has it. And we'll begin the roll program. Uh, not quite nominal on the beginning of the roll program, but uh, Valentina Kerman seems to have it. Speaking of which, for this 7th EDB shuttle mission, the commander is Valentina Kerman, who was also the commander on ETS-1 and ETS-2, as well as backup pilot on ETS-6. The engineer is Durfel, who also flew on ETS-3. Bob is a scientist, and he flew previously with Valentina on ETS-1 and ETS-2. Last but not least, backup pilot is Haytrude Kerman, who was commander on ETS-4 and backup pilot on ETS-3. Even though this mission is only bringing up one of two support arms for the Orion Space Liner, the EDB has decided that should this mission be successful, they will launch the Orion 1 Space Liner to Hoffman Station. Hatred Kerman has already been selected to be the pilot for that mission, and so it'll be a quick turnaround for Hatred uh, if that mission goes on as planned. That launch of the Orion 1 to Hoffman Station will likely carry five new crew members for Hoffman Station, and so it won't be carrying tourists or other passengers, but rather a uh, station crew. And the expectation is that Bob Kerman, who is flying on this mission, will probably be among those crew as we see booster engine out and boosters set. And with the boosters separating, you'll, you may note that there is a difference to the external tank. We are uh, flying with an advanced external tank that is meant to be used after it reaches orbit. So the external tank will be placed in orbit and it has two docking ports underneath the nose cones and so it can be reused for other purposes. On its tail it also has uh, four very small radial engines so that it can adjust its orbit and it has a controller and a battery that is currently shut down and on once it has decided what to do with the external tank they will activate that battery. Putting the external tank into orbit will not require any change in the shuttle's normal launch profile. In other words, after it reaches its target apoapsis, the main engines will still shut down. It will be the rapiers that will bring the external tank as well as the shuttle into orbit as usual. Uh, however, the rapiers will be drawing from the external tank's fuel in order to push everything into orbit instead of using the space shuttle's onboard fuel. Here we see the upper two rapiers being lit in order to help with stability. Uh, this is a normal procedure, of course. And here we see target apoapsis being reached, and we will have main engine shutdown. There we have the shutdown of three skipper engines on board the shuttle. The shuttle reorients here, and at apoapsis, lights all of the four rapiers and begins to make its way to orbit with the external tank. However, of course, uh, the, ex the rapiers are not angled to uh, do this job very well and so they have to be throttled to a very low amount in order to help maintain stability and you saw the burners firing there in order to make sure that the pitch was alright and the shuttle could aim at the prograde vector. Here we have external tank set, external tank separation. Now there was a flaw in the mission plan. The nose cones really should have been disposed while the assembly was suborbital. And so now uh, the decoupling of the nose cones to free the docking ports means that they will be space debris in orbit. This is obviously suboptimal and the EDB will have to reconsider the mission order here. But uh, for now, 
they do decoupled nose cones and the external tank is safely in orbit and ready for use. The shuttle is currently in a lower orbit in order to catch up to Hoffman Station and opens its cargo bay and you can see the pieces of the Orion support arm. They will have to be assembled one at a time. There are three pieces that have been brought up this time. Though it took some time to catch up to Hoffman Station, the shuttle managed to make its rendezvous with a minimal amount of Delta V. However, since the shuttle's rapiers used the external tank's fuel to get everything into orbit instead of using the shuttle's fuel, that meant that the shuttle actually had much more fuel at this point than it normally would, and it will be landing with more fuel as well. And so that was uh, another minor mission planning issue. A side effect of the fact that the shuttle required very little Delta V to rendezvous with Hoffman Station was that the external tank came rather close to Hoffman Station uh, during this pass and of course that's because its orbit and the shuttle's orbit were rather, were rather similar and the small difference between that orbit and what was required to rendezvous with Hoffman Station meant that the external tank was still hanging around along with its two nose cones so that's going to be another problem. Really the entire matter of getting the external tank to be usable in orbit uh, has been a headache for the EDB and they might have to reconsider the whole idea. Okay, here we have the deployment of the ARM modules, the ARM pieces, if you will. And actually they will be let out of the cargo bay in reverse order. And so there's actually a third piece that will be added to the station. You can see that each piece has its own control core, its own RCS, and its own batteries. And they are remotely controlled as usual and will be added to the station via remote control here. And so there is the second piece exiting the cargo bay of the shuttle. And finally, the first piece that will be added to the station exiting the cargo bay of the shuttle. Extraordinary care, of course, being taken to ensure that each piece is kept well apart from the others and also clears the shuttle bay safely. This here is quite a view of the three trusses approaching the station and truss number one lining itself up here and will proceed ahead of the other two. Quite a bit of maneuvering here. Now you'll note that the three truss segments are very different in fact, they're not identical and that is because of the way that the arm has to line up with the hatches on the Orion 1 and so you'll see some of the trusses have ladders sticking out here and there and that is because of where they have to line up with those hatches. So here we go, the first piece zooming on ahead. It doesn't line up with any of the hatches, that's why it doesn't have a ladder sticking out perpendicularly. Now getting the rotation right is important, though not so much for this segment as much as for the next two, because the Ryan has to fit right up next to them. That is, uh, right next to those ladders and truss segments sticking out like that. And so once we are privileged enough to see an Orion 1 docking, we will see how that all works out. But here the first segment lines up with the existing portion of the arm. And then gingerly makes its way towards the small docking port there. This segment is similar to that previous segment that you see it lining up with. Okay, here we go. And magnetism. That one is safely on the station and we will proceed with arm segment 2. This one is a little bit askew but mission control rules it okay and it did not need to be redocked. Again, now this one has to be rotated properly otherwise it will not work out with the space liner in place. You can see it's, it's truss and ladder sticking out there. It won't really be clear until the Orion 1 actually docks at the station, but the arm will give you an idea how big the Orion 1 is compared to the station. And as we see the arms sort of sticking out on one side of the station, you'll get an idea of the length involved with the space liner. Okay, here we have segment number two approaching the target docking port. It looks all lined up. But again, rotation is important on this one.
Okay, magnetism and and a docking. All right. That's all docked up and Mission Control ruled it okay. And so it came time for the third segment. However, on closer inspection, Mission Control discovered that there was a manufacturing defect on this on this segment of the arm. Uh, in particular, there was a docking port missing on one side. In fact, that was the side that would have to dock with the second segment of the arm. If a docking port was missing on the opposite side, it wouldn't have been so severe. But without a docking port on the side that was meant to connect to the rest of the arm, there was no way that this segment could be used, and it was returned to the docking bay of the shuttle. Uh, investigations are ongoing as to how that docking port could possibly have been missed or lost perhaps, perhaps lost on launch somehow, that's quite unclear, but uh, here it is uh, returning to the Illinois D shuttle, getting lined up with the cargo bay, and finally it can only really line up with the docking port once it is in the cargo bay and so it's leaving some space in order to do that and there it is lining up with the docking port and and connection and it is safely in the cargo bay of the shuttle whether the EDB can launch the Orion 1 space liner with a foreshortened arm one segment missing is currently under review but it's possible that since there is an access point for one of the upper hatches of the Orion 1 space liner that will be sufficient but for now we'll have this view of Hoffman Station and there you can see how far the support arm extends even with one segment missing and so that is a foreshortened arm and yeah it extends that far out from the station and you can imagine another support arm on the opposite side to uh, have access there alright and with that the Illinois shuttle uh, made its way down to a lower orbit, a 100 kilometer by 100 kilometer orbit, and then proceeded to make its descent burn for return to the KSC. Once again, Mission Control was concerned about the heavy fuel load that the shuttle would be returning with, and here you see it burning to a periapsis of just under 26 kilometers, as is typical. The concern was essentially that this would somehow alter the space shuttle's profile to put outside of the normal bounds of where it sets its pitch, uh, but uh, Valentina Kerman did not elect to burn off any, any of the fuel by running the Werner ports and doing sort of a zigzag side to side in order to get rid of the fuel, instead uh, testing out, testing out whether the shuttle could land with this fuel load. Here you see the trajectory as it began to cross the Western Ocean. Valentina set the pitch initially at 40 degrees and here you see the shuttle encountering some heat as it passed below 46 kilometers, though a minor at this point. The shuttle's trajectory was pretty consistently aimed directly at the KSC and uh, as it started to bring it in Valentina also started to pitch down. Here we have the shuttle as it continued across the Western Ocean, now getting quite a lot more flame effects. Incidentally, the flames in the gear wells is quite nominal and expected. There is extra thermal protection in those areas. Valentina did her best to maintain course directly at the KSC and uh, and adjusted pitch accordingly, did not have to go to any extreme low pitches, pitch tended to be between 30 and 40 degrees. In the new aerodynamic regime, the, the western mountains pose no danger to the shuttle as it flies quite high above them, and you see switching to air breathing mode on the rapier is rather earlier than normal, but not a problem here. Uh, not running the engines up though, and Valentina pitches down smoothly as the velocity gets to be a manageable amount and the shuttle can begin gliding towards the KSC. While there had been some instability during previous missions during this phase, there was no such instability here and Valentina was uh, thoroughly in control and thoroughly excited as well as you can see. Chances are that the improved stability of the shuttle was due to the distribution of the mass load and the fact that it was heavier 
and so the EDB engineers will be looking into uh, how it was how it was balanced in this case and attempt to mimic that on future shuttle missions. However, analysis is complicated by the fact that there is no mod propellant and mod propellant is usually kept very far forward in the shuttle and also the fact that the shuttle is carrying back down some cargo this time for the first time ever in the form of that third segment of the arm. Uh, here the shuttle is on final approach with air brakes out and and we have a Kraken strike and it seems like the Kraken strike is related to some sort of explosion on the launch pad. Uh, is it possible that some rockets were fired from the launch pad at the shuttle thereby taking out pieces of the wing? We are uncertain. That might be how the Kraken manifests itself or it might be some sort of other nefarious deed at work but in any case Valentina uh, was not perturbed at all. The shuttle was understandably a little bit more jittery on descent now with, uh, with the pieces missing and its aerodynamics uh, quite altered by that. But Valentina still had the shuttle lined up albeit a little bit to the left and uh, continued to bring it down with extraordinary focus. You are 50 meters. 10 and a little bit of lift there and touchdown touchdown a very careful touchdown there understandably so and at any moment we'll have the deployment of the drag chute drag chute deployed and the shuttle is slowing down and another wing piece was lost and surveying the damage it looks like looks like all the damage is to the left wing that appears to undermine the possibility that the launch pad is the source of the strike uh, possibly whatever occurred on the launch pad and this Kraken strike or other strike uh, might have merely been coincidental or part of some sort of larger plot it's entirely uncertain until further investigations get underway but here we have the safe return of the Illinois D shuttle with Valentina, Durful, Bob and Hatrude and we will look forward to perhaps the launch of the Orion 1 space liner to the station with the intent of transferring five new crew members to join Jebediah Kerman on board. And with that we'll say thank you for watching this presentation of ETS-7 from the EDB. If you enjoyed watching this mission please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions please leave them in the comment section below. And we'll see you next time.